Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here and a great privilege to do Grand Round. So uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Goodkin and uh, the people that make the Grand Rounds decisions. And thanks to uh, the residents for uh, meeting for a brief breakfast meeting this morning. Very interesting and uh, I always learn more than uh, I teach. And that's why I love visiting and learning what other people are dealing with. Um, this is a little bit different uh, lecture, certainly different than yesterday in terms of measurement-based care. Some of you were at that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to raise, this is more of a discussion and uh, thought provocation as opposed to a data compilation and encyclopedic review of something you can read anyway. Um, and I want to talk about, and, and, I, and I'm very, very aware um, that uh, doing psychotherapy in, in psychiatric practice has become more and more difficult economically as well as time-wise. And I'm also very aware that we've had this huge division between psychology and psychiatry where the, in the worst of all situations, the psychiatrist writes scripts and the psychologist talks to the patient for about 10 minutes or maybe an hour or two if they are able to do it. But their fees are going down, so we drop it down from someone who's more expensive with a PhD to less expensive with a master's, who's even less expensive with a bachelor's, who's just a nice, friendly person who got out of high school uh, with a GED to, gee, I guess you could rent someone to just be nice or get a dog. And what I'm, what I'm describing is, uh, in somewhat negative terms, I, I think the reversal of lots of stuff that I had the opportunity to do when I was a resident. So when I was a resident at Penn, we had something called Systems of Psychotherapy, which was a course, and I got to see and be taught by a cognitive therapist back, a behavior therapist, Wolpe and Brady, psychodynamic therapist, psychoanalytic therapist, family therapist, Sal Mnuchin, couples therapy, and I did seven group therapy, uh, ran seven uh, different group, groups over the years, and I learned psychodrama when I was uh, actually in the military. So, so I have a lot of therapy background, and I love doing therapy, and I've done research on therapy, but I'm more known as like star D and do a depression and algorithms. And the reason I think that therapy is important, and I'm gonna raise some issues in this, this discussion, is many of the things that our patients have trouble with are not addressable by molecules. They're addressable by rethinking, redoing, relearning, new learning, undoing, et cetera. And to, to deal with that in a more narrow focus, I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk about patients with depression, so it's narrowed, whose psychotherapy we may have been neglecting, especially if they're taking antidepressant medications. So that's the focus, depression, antidepressant medication, now therapy for the things that you encounter when you treat a depressed patient with antidepressant medications. I think what I'm going to say has applicability to people with schizophrenia, autism, any other so-called mental or neuropsychiatric condition in which a medication or a device is being used in which patients have to do something to help us help them. Okay. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I'm not talking about anything here that from which I make money, except there is true confession. They, book that Tim Beck wrote, of which I'm a co-author, Cognitive Therapy of Depression, is still selling. So I do get an honorarium from that, but according to the Conflict of Interest Office, it's not a conflict of interest to get money from books, just to let you know. So here's my question. Have we, and remember when, when I started, this is way back in, uh, what, uh, 72 to 75, the big issue on the table was does psychotherapy do anything for anything? other than you're being nice to people. The whole field moved forward very dramatically with the use of randomized controlled trials and, and symptoms as a primary outcome. It invaded psychology and psychiatry, and in fact was how we as psychotherapists earned our creds. Oh, if you can drop that Hamilton, you gotta be good. If you can drop it as good as the drug, you're really good, okay? And we got very, very focused on that who's, who's Hamilton, can we drop, and will the, the drop stay down? And we took the entire model from psychopharmacology and said, this therapy should do that, and indeed back frame the therapy to go after a negative view of self, world, and future to reduce the symptoms of depression. But the contention here is, have we actually 
missed opportunities because of this hyper-focus on symptoms. That's not to say they're bad to focus on, they're critical. But have we, like, not even looked at other stuff that we need to look at? So my thesis is that the aim of depression treatment is sustained asymptomatic state, the aim. You don't always get this with everybody. Normal function, of course, minimal risk of relapse. But the current reality, and now I'm focusing on the antidepressant uh, treatment experience, is antidepressant medications, ADMs, the outcomes are really not very good. And when you look carefully, I'll go through some of this, they're startlingly, uh, they're startlingly ungood or not. I mean, they're a little bit of a shock because we get better results in randomized trials that are kind of done in a greenhouse with selected people than we do in the real world. What are the obstacles that get in the way of making our drugs work as well as they can for our patients? Not to say that they're a cure for everybody, they are not. Well, it's engagement. Lots of people drop out before, even after the first visit. Retention, drop out in the middle of treatment. They're in treatment, they're not playing ball with us. The treatments are not well tailored to the patient. Function still remains a problem and relapse is a continuing issue. These obstacles, in my view, I think create opportunities for psychotherapy in a systematic targeted way, which may not be symptom targeted cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, et cetera. So here's some of the background and then I'm gonna go through each of these elements. Look at the, look at the kinds of loss rates and these are, of course, from a wide range of studies. I can't list all the studies because there's many, many studies. But we know for sure the chances of a person showing up after the first evaluation in regular practice, not just in randomized trials, is, you know, you lose about 10%, maybe 15%. Maybe you're different, and by the time the patient comes to see you, you are the person of last resort. And you know, when they let go of you, they let go of life. And so you don't have that dropout. But Many, many people have that level. The dropout between the first visit and the end of acute 10, 12 weeks, eight weeks, is also substantial. In STAR-D, it was about 25%, and this was with nurse augmenting uh, resources in the clinic, both in primary care and specialty care. So we, we added resources, and we still couldn't keep people in, and we had a huge incentive to keep them in. Uh, medication adherence are highly variable. Uh, it's surprising who's not taking medication that you and I might be seeing, or at least not taking it properly. The doses are low. That's well established. Lots of people drop out of continuation and certainly maintenance treatment. And the irony is our antidepressant uh, long-term treatment guidelines from the U.S., from the APA, from the HCPR, now HRQ, from the British Association of Psychopharmacology says three or more episodes lifetime maintenance medication. How many patients actually get this genius recommendation? About 10%. Most don't. Why is that? And maybe the recommendation's flawed. So we'll, we'll examine that. And our recovery rates in terms of function and relapse rates obviously can be uh, helped. So this is the model that we've been uh, run by for many, many years for psychopharmacology and in general, psychotherapy, because if you look at uh, Steve Holland's studies, DeRubis' studies, Robin Jarrett's studies, Mike Thais' studies, Ellen Frank's studies, et cetera, you, you are generally following this symptom pattern. Get the symptoms to go away. That's not a bad idea, but there's two problems with it. Number one, you can't always get the symptoms to go away, so-called difficult to treat depressions. And the second is, even if you get rid of the symptoms, the patient may have a screwed up life and or other unhealthy behaviors, in which case you can count on them coming back. And then we call that breakthrough, poop out, pharma, uh, uh, some sort of a, a, a drug effect or uh, uncooperative patient. I think a better way to look at this, and, and I presented this briefly yesterday, but I want to spend a little more time on it today. And that is, if you look at the left-hand column, these are the obstacles or challenges, or I like opportunities, to do better with our depressed patients, and I'd say more than depressed patients. And, and why do I say that? Because I gave you numbers on some of this already, right? We know these are big problems. Now, how big are these problems? The drug placebo difference in an antidepressant drug versus a placebo is maybe 15, 20 percent response or remission differences. So that means you have to treat seven people to get one of them to benefit from the treatment. So six times out of seven, we're giving a drug that actually isn't changing the outcome for that 
person. They're either going to get better anyway, or they're not going to get better anyway, but you got that magic one out of seven, 15% and NT kind of range, and that's typical in medicine as a whole. But remember, that means some people got their symptoms better, but not entirely under control. Now you have an opportunity for therapy to go after the residual symptoms, one. Two, even if their, their symptoms get a whole lot better, their function may not, and that's another therapeutic opportunity. So I would propose that looking at things from this more patient-centered perspective, uh, we might be able to cogitate up where th therapeutic interventions might help they can be very brief, very targeted, but very effective to solve this problem. So, my proposal would be that whenever you ask the patient to change behavior, you have a psychotherapy, psychotherapeutic opportunity. Sometimes patients readily engage and they don't need therapy, they're in. Sometimes they're very diligent like me when I manage my, my antihypertensive drugs. I don't miss. Why don't I miss? Because I've seen people with strokes, that's why. So I'm, I'm a high adherer. Okay? But many patients aren't. They haven't had that experience. And they may have very mixed attitudes towards medication, and there's been a lot of studies, by the way, in general medicine and even surgery about patients' attitudes and compliance or adherence and follow-through and complications. It's amazing we don't have as much in the mental health area. It's interesting. Anyway, uh, these are, I think, some of the uh, opportunities for uh, engaging people with uh, therapeutically if, in fact, these are a challenge. They're not for everyone at all times, but if they are a challenge, I think we have to address them. So I'm going to walk you through some, a little more detail about the problems and some suggestions about opportunities, and then I hope we would have a discussion about what I'm, what I'm saying. Because I don't know how to go from here's the problem, here's the opportunities, to actually fixing the problem. And that would be how do you do this in the clinic. But again, I already showed you some of these data, so we know that uh, engagement and retention uh, is, a, is a real problem. Who is it mostly a problem with? Lower SES patients, less educated patients, minority patients, we showed that in STAR-D. If you come with either uh, little knowledge or adverse knowledge, meaning you have beliefs that are actually counter to what is, is actually happening, your dropout rate is going to be higher. It isn't just people that are established patients, because these were all established patients in STAR-D, it's also brand new patients that never been treated. There's a recent uh, article, uh, a PREDICT study from Emory that uh, Dunlop uh, reported. These were largely untreated patients. Their dropout rate was, all, and they had a lot, and their Hamilton was like 22. They're seriously depressed. But their dropout rate, even given free treatment, and the extra nurse was on the order of magnitude of what I'm showing you here. Do we have any tools to actually assess the problem? I'm not, I've thought of giving you a whole list, but I'll just give you a few by way of example. And, and that is, there, there are uh, studies and tools that have been done largely not in mental illness area, um, where the patient actually thinks the drug may or may not be needed, probably not needed, but has a high risk or side effect. That's their belief about a drug that's being given to them, whether it's for hypertension or for uh, gastrointestinal problems or whatever. The problem is that that means the patient is doing a very personal, silent, cost-benefit analysis. High cost, minimal benefit, hasta la vista. I'm out of here. I don't think we even talk to patients like that because I think we, sp we say, take X and it'll be this much and the side effects might come here and you know, we describe what's going to go on and we might be good enough to say when we should see something. We might even be good enough to say how we're going to measure that. But we often don't say, you know, what do you think about taking this medicine? What does it mean to you? And it's, it's ironic because we're the meaning subspecialty. <laughs> the guys in internal medicine are doing rating scales to figure out what does it mean to you? Why aren't we doing that? We, and, and we know this is a problem. So we do have tools. We can investigate what's behind it. Do we have options for doing anything about it? So it's one thing to say it's a problem. You've got to have a tool to fix it because you've got to be able to measure it or at least uh, you know, get, conceptualize it. And then you've got to be able to do something. Well, there's a lot of stuff that, that I, could, I could sit in this audience, we could do a workshop on 50 ways to engage patients. Which kinds of patients should be engaged in which kinds of ways? What do you say to patients that helps you retain that patient in practice? That's a lot of clinical wisdom that we don't even sit and discuss anymore. I, I, for example, I ask patients, how do you make big decisions in your life? Some people make it intellectually, some people make it from 
an expert, some people make it emotionally, some people take a long time to measure everything and then finally you know, make a decision. The reason I like to know that is because I'm getting to know the patient and what is going to drive them towards having to make a change in their behavior. Remember, that's the indication for psychotherapy, I think. Anyway, <clears throat> for engagement, obviously, uh, things like agreeing on the goals, when can I expect what to happen, how will I know if it's happening, and what's the probability it's going to happen to me, are all very, very important things. They also want to know things like, um, gee, if I take the drug, am I going to get side effects? So now we look in the PDR, if you give a drug to 100 people, what kind of side effects do you get? That's the beginning, because that's the acute side effects. But they also should know, and they often ask, if it gets better, will I still have the side effects? If I'm going to take the drug in the long term, am I going to, what side effects am I going to have? That's very hard to find, because it's not in the PDR. They only give you side effects for everybody who got the drug, and they give it to you for placebo, because it's done for regulatory purposes, and you go, oh, you get the drug, you get this, you don't get the drug, you get that. It answers the question, but that's not the only question that the patients ask, right? So I think that some of the implications of what I'm saying is actually doing research or even reporting research that's been done in ways that are more clinically uh, appropriate and relevant to clinical decision making. Many of us will recommend plan, will, will say, we have a plan B, I have another backup in case this doesn't work, we'll know it doesn't work at such and such a time. Okay, so we have options to deal with engagement and retention. What about adherence? We can measure adherence. Adherence is definitely a problem. Adherence is more of a problem as the, as the patient's illness gets better, less symptomatic, less needed to treat, uh, take, take treatment. I, I was uh, counseling a woman who was a nurse whose father died of stroke at age 52 because her, her internist sent the patient to me because she was having trouble taking medication for hypertension. Now, can you imagine this? A nurse, 35 years old, father died of stroke 52. By the way, she's working in an NHLBI study on high cholestyramine, the outcome of stroke or heart attack or death. So this is a fairly knowledgeable person. How could she not be taking medication? When you burrow into that in just a few interviews, it turns out, and I use kind of a cognitive approach, it turns out that she knew that if she didn't take the medication, it meant she wasn't sick. She wasn't going to be like her father wasn't going to have hypertension. You go, this is completely crazy. No, no, it's just the irrational part of the brain operating to help her not get well. The good news is that her internist sent her to me and she was motivated enough to really look at this. And she would tell you, I just, I, I put a reminder on the mirror and blah, blah. It wasn't a reminder problem. It was a meaning problem. It was an internal problem. It's a psych problem. Stuff that we can do easily. It doesn't take 50 sessions, but if you don't do it, I, you know, the, this poor person could have wound up like her dad. Anyway, lots of tools, MEMS caps, uh, rating scales, pill counts, iCloud reporting. You've got more apps than you can imagine. I've looked at like 50 apps on how to remember to take your pills. They're not meaning apps, they're count apps. Okay. And are, is there anything we can do with adherence? Well, I just gave you a case example, and yes, there's lots of things we can do. When do we do that? How do we find patients to do that with? Do we wait for the patient to not adhere? Do we actually even measure that? Do we ask the patient in a way that they can tell us without embarrassing themselves and messing, us, messing up our relationship with them? I think we don't really focus on it very much, but when you actually put MEMS caps in or other kinds of tools, research has shown, adherence is a big problem. And it's a bigger problem in the longer term than the shorter term, and you can understand why. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's with all of us. Uh, there are rating scales. Uh, here's an example of, a of the MARS, the Medication Adherence Rating Scale. You know, uh, describing, if you will, your, your uh, adherence behaviors. Here's the rest of the scale. Um, and you get a little bit of the attitude, but mostly the experience of medication. It's not a meaning scale, it's a behavior scale, but an important scale. What about symptoms? Well, we talked about that a little bit yesterday. These are the figures on not just the symptoms, but what do we do? How do we get symptoms down? It, that depends on the medication, adherence, and longevity and duration, and the stuff we talked about yesterday with uh, measurement-based care. So symptom control is critical, but how much do we and with whom do we engage in shared decision-making? This is sort of the art of medicine, as it's called, but 
<clears throat> a lot of us have experiences on how to do that with various kinds of people. Some are easy, some are borderline, or other issues come up, if, if you will. Um, so, and what do you do? And is there a way to do this in, that is systematic, interpersonally effective, cheap, efficient, uh, and shouldn't it be studied? And who do we do that with? We don't have to do that with everybody. Some, some patients, when you offer shared decision making, say, look, I don't want to share on the decision. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And they really will do it. And so it isn't like we have to do symptom control, um, shared decision making, targeted interventions on everybody. We've got to find out when it might be called for. What is the indication? What are we going to do? And are we getting the effect that we, that we want? OK. Function is a huge area. Remember back in the uh, original uh, symptom uh, response remission relapse recurrence slide, that was all about symptoms. Now we know now with a lot of studies that symptoms get better typically before function at least gets fully restored. And we know that some people whose symptoms get better, their function gets maybe better a little bit, but not really needing to go where they need to go. So this is a challenge because we may start with the conviction that in a subset of people, medication will not only resolve all the symptoms, remission, but will actually restore function. The evidence that that is true for the vast majority of patients is actually missing. So who can we really get better and have expectation of functional recovery? Well, they're the easy ones. They're the ones that if the healthcare system moved properly, would never see a psychiatrist because they would have been cured in primary care, literally. But that's not how it works, so sometimes we get the easy ones and we often get the hard ones. And <clears throat> how many are there? Well, the remission rate's about 25 to 30 percent. Of the remitted patients, about 80 percent have re returned to more, largely normal function. And their risk of relapse is less than 20 percent in a year, if well managed. On the other hand, that gives you 65% who didn't remit, but maybe another 25% who responded but didn't remit. There we adjust the drugs, but at some point our adjustments don't work any better than that. And now we have to manage a disease as opposed to shoot for remission. And now we're doing chronic disease management, functional restoration, and relapse prevention as our primary uh, effort. So it's very much like cardiovascular disease, not everybody with CHF gets fully well after you treat them. So we're managing their condition. Anyway, um, functional restoration then should be implemented with a variety of techniques with particular indications for particular patients to be done over a particular period of time to see whether it's effective. We don't have a lot of data like that. We know it's a problem, we can see it, but we don't to my knowledge, we have some modest uh, psychotherapeutic interventions that have looked at function, but it's usually function in the acute phase, not function in the longer term. And that's where we really want to go. Do we have tools to measure it? Absolutely. We've got a host of tools. This is just four. There's lots of them. So we have a problem. It, it doesn't apply to everybody. We have some things we can do. And we have tools to, to, by which to measure it. This is a simple Sheehan disability scale. I showed it yesterday, work and social adjustment scale, and so on. Here's the things that we can do. Therapy around marriage, around job, around self-esteem, around guilt, uh, around repairing relationships that have been destroyed by a chronic and recurrent illness, bipolar, unipolar, and think of the other illnesses that we treat. Mindfulness works in a number of people, so environmental changes may be required. Leave a marriage with an abusive spouse, change a job that's unsatisfactory, etc. So there's lots of things we can do to make function better. But when do you do it, on whom do you do it, and do you get an effect? And when? that whole thing is like missing from our, in my view, research portfolio, but we do it clinically. And then finally, relapse amelioration or uh, trying to, to keep relapses from happening. Relapses are very common. The best things we can do, as you all know, remission as opposed to response, get symptoms under great control whenever you can, but you can't always do that, and manage the kinds of precipitants uh, that people uh, confront or exacerbating factors that continue to put them at high risk, including things that they do, which are listed under risk factors. Substance abuse, treating other psychiatric disorders, 
sleep-wake disorders, anxiety disorders, and so on, substance abuse, substance misuse, overuse, and of course all of the other, the, their prior history, episodes, uh, agent onset, and chronicity are things you can't treat, but the risk factors you can treat. So when do you treat them? When do you implement it? How good is the treatment? That whole genre of things that you, you and I would think about doing, when we turn to evidence to do evidence-based interventions, we don't have too much. And I would, th I would my, my proposal is that in fact, if you were to start to focus on, let's just say, functional restoration, and we were to un unleash our um, research expertise in this area, could we in fact come up with short packages that can be delivered by ourselves or colleagues, staff, in ways that are effective for patients so that they go from stage one symptom control to stage two functional restoration to stage three relapse prevention in a systematic way, just as you would do with any other condition like cancer or, or heart disease. I think that we don't think like that so much, but I think that we should because that conceptualization sets a research agenda and it's a way to collect clinical experiences and put together processes and procedures and, and uh, training experiences that are aimed at helping patients and their families survive these kinds of illnesses. This is the relapse data from the STAR-D study, uh, you, and I showed a, a bit of it yesterday, but the two things, which patients do we see? We see the patients at steps two, three, and more likely four, and look at, look at our issues that we have. Relapse rates are high whether they're in remission or they're just responding, uh, and uh, our chances of remission with the next step get lower and lower, so we are dealing with more treatment-resistant people and our treatments are causing more and more side effects. So we're kind of in a corner. Now, maybe TMS, maybe ketamine, maybe drugs that are effective on the immune system, other things will be coming down the pike. But at the moment, our, uh, the, the portion of this diagram that we deal with are the threes and fours. This is tough. So do we need to have different approaches for these kinds of patients, some of whom will be difficult to treat and not get into remission? So now we're, now we're developing therapies to manage a chronic condition in a way that's effective. Not much has really been worked on, on that way. They, we call that a failure, but you know, these patients are not failures. That's just a limitation of what we can do. And now we gotta do what we do better with a different target in different ways. But the psychotherapy research community hasn't looked at this. The psychiatry research community that does therapy has not looked at this. So we're, we're kind of uh, sailing without much uh, evidence. Uh, intuition's great, but maybe just the beginning, and maybe there's a way to address this problem better. This is a slide I showed yesterday. This is uh, from a group of patients PayCal put together, and these are patients who are, I would say, good prognosis, uncomplicated, not lots of general medical problems, not lots of psychiatric problems. And the reason I show you this slide today it's because look at the ones without uh, residual symptoms. They still have a 20% relapse rate in 12 months. So we're missing something. We say, oh, you get symptom control, you get them in remission, they have a great prognosis. Well, yeah, for 80%, but 20% not so much. And these are the easy ones. They have, we have removed the risk factors for relapse here. <clears throat> so the real numbers are, as I showed you from before, a little bit higher. So the key here is, who needs more therapy? Does therapy work in these people who are going to be, um, uh, are going to relapse, at least in terms of symptoms? And what about the function, not just for those that relapse, but those that have not? Is there an indicator in terms of function or quality of life that would put people in the high relapse uh, group, even though they've hit symptomatic remission? For relapse, uh, we obviously have lots of tools, again. We know certain things are correlates of or risk factors for relapse. Depressive symptoms, anxious symptoms, sleep disturbances, stress ratings, substance use disorder ratings, uh, and we know that um, improvement in overall health and wellness is a factor that contributes to lowering relapse. And we know that relapse is gonna happen, but is there a systematic way to 
teach patients to monitor symptoms? How often do we do that? What do we do when they find symptoms? Is there a way to tailor the long-term management to individuals? A lot of us do this, but there's no systematic compilation of what we do. And wouldn't that be nice to have that, even some training videotapes for residents and psychology uh, graduate students, uh, to say nothing of uh, helping us do our, our job better with a systematic kind of approach. We have the tools. Do we have options? Absolutely we have options. We have lots of things and they are borrowed from the area of addiction, from the, some work in uh, uh, depression, some work in anxiety disorders, some work in schizophrenia. There's lots of stuff that we can do, but again, going to the library or going to the research literature and finding it in a place that you can use it with some evidence that it works and some indications of when to use it becomes a challenge. Certainly stress management, uh, having people who are uh, highly dependent on a few people for their well-being to diversify what I call their emotional portfolio. Uh, mindfulness has some evidence of efficacy in the long-term and relapse prevention. And obviously the, the uh, lifestyle changes, particularly substance misuse, can be critical to say nothing of the uh, early prodrome identification, which can implement either a behavioral strategy or a medication revision. And finally, I want to talk about medication continuation. I, I alluded to this initially uh, when I said, gee, the guidelines say uh, three episodes uh, stay on for a lifetime, and then you go out and see how many are doing that. This is more like a wish. It's a fantasy. It doesn't happen. So I'm going to contend that, so I'm going to put forth an idea about medication discontinuation, which is maybe a little controversial and counter the guidelines. The guidelines recommend this, as I mentioned, long-term, especially for chronic and three episode or more recurrent patients, uh, and that they really need maintenance treatment. And uh, many patients don't like that idea. And the compromise is, well, let's see if you need it, so I'll taper you down, but I'll watch you like a hawk, and if you need it, you need it. If you don't, you don't. And we know you ought to taper a little bit more slowly, especially with bipolar patients, but also probably unipolar patients. And we provide some support, and that sort of re-entry is, is a dicey period. Best undertaken when the patient is, you know, at least reasonably well in a consistent manner for a year or eight months. And holding that out, increases the chances they'll stay long, long enough to get into a stable state from the medicine. Okay, but if you look at uh, what actually happens, and again, I showed this yesterday, but now for a different reason, the, uh, the Karen Wise's study showed that drugs beat placebo. This is the kind of different, in recurrent depression, by the way, this is after acute, uh, eight weeks of acute treatment or 12 weeks, and then they were followed. Some got placebo, some got drug. This, this is one of like 50 that I could show you. They're almost all the same. And look at the difference that you get. Conclusion, bupropion is a more effective uh, treatment at preventing relapse than placebo. Okay, in people with recurrent depression. Okay, so now we write a guideline. And the guideline is supposed to be all about populations, right? So it says, gee, three or more episodes, because those are the ones that have a very high probability of fourth. One episode, chances of the next 50%. Two episodes, chances of the next 70%. Three episodes, chances of the next 80%. Four episodes, you're gonna have another episode. And the only question is when, not whether. Looking at group data. On the other hand, if you, and, and in by and large, by the way, the, the numbers come out, if you have an episode of 21 and 32, so that's 11 years, divide that by two, your next episode should be 70% of the time about 37. And then it more, stay more or less the same, it's a little shorter. So you want me to stay on a drug for 11 years to prevent that second episode? Most patients go, I don't think so, but they don't know that data that I just gave you. So what they do is they use it common sense and they go, I only had one episode, heck, half the time, maybe more than that, I don't need a drug anyway, so we don't give them the drug with one episode, chronic. We maintenance and or continuation stop. This, this group, shows you that half the time, at least in a year, in recurrent depression, by the way, you had to have two or three episodes to be in this, not one, half the time you don't need the drug, okay? The patients are deciding whether I'm the person that needs the drugs, they stop their drug, okay? What can we do in terms of psychotherapy? Because remember, we wanna have behavior change. 
what change do we want and who do we want to have, whose behavior do we want to have change? Well, we don't necessarily want to push everybody to, uh, to maintenance treatment, even if they have recurrent depression. Why? Because in a year, half the time they don't need it. On the other hand, we don't want to miss anybody who can have a severe episode and have a recurrence and get into real trouble. So what do we do and how do we manage that? And is there an opportunity for a therapeutic uh, intervention here? And I would say the following. Even with recurrent depression, unless the episodes are clustered together or there's really not much recovery between the episodes, so they're really not out of episode, if it's episodic depression and they're spread apart, the issue becomes who can discontinue and how can you do it safely. Now that's a therapeutic opportunity in two ways. If they need the drug, they got to come back in a timely fashion. If they don't need the drug, terrific, then we, then we space out their, uh, their visits and stand by arming them with a rating scale or some way to communicate uh, getting into trouble if it happens. So there's a lot of options that we can deal with these individuals with chronic or recurrent depression for whom drug discontinuation m might be a good thing. And it, it is entirely possible that even people with chronic depression whose life gets better, whose symptoms get better, whose job changes, whose marital issues either dissolve, resolve, or uh, or the marriage is uh, uh, ended, they can feel a whole lot better and their chronic depression is not chronic. Now, if their chronic depression is not chronic, they don't need medication. So considering when to go off medication as well as when to push to continue on medication are complex issues. And I'm not saying it can be done overnight, but I do think these, the reality is patients are stopping drugs. Some should, some shouldn't. So we might want to get on top of this from a therapeutic and medical management perspective in better ways than we do now. So this is my summary. I hope you'll have some questions and comments. I really think that we have oversold symptom remission as a feasible goal for more people than it's realistically a feasible goal for. And whether or not it's a feasible goal, we have hard, large loss rates with engagement, retention, adherence, full functional restoration, and if you will, kind of diligent relapse amelioration and long-term management, whether it's with or without medication. When you turn to how to do things in this arena, these arenas, there are four or five or six arenas here, uh, we're a little bit short of uh, the kind of guidance with evidence that we would expect if we were treating with a medication or even if we were doing surgery. So my contention is, and this is not just limited to depression, I use depression as an example. Um, my contention is this is great opportunity for clinicians to compile their wisdom, develop guidance, manuals, test these ideas, see for whom it works. It's kind of the thing that Tim Beck did a long time ago along with other people, uh, Clareman and so on, with cognitive therapy, interpersonal therapy and so on. Uh, they saw a need. And uh, they put their heads together and their experience together and came up with some ideas and created some tools. I think we still have a need for really better tools, uh, better positioned and clearly indicated for certain individuals. Not to say that everybody needs therapy or everybody needs drugs. So let me say thank you very much and happy to have questions.